All right, let's talk about the R7. Is it the best bang for buck video camera in its price range? What are some of the pros and cons to be aware of? Who is it for and should you buy it? Now, personally, I bought it because I was intrigued by the 4K at 60 frames per second in a camera for just $1,500. It was six years ago that I bought my 1DX Mark II because I wanted 4K at 60, but at that time, it sent me back six grand. And now, six years later, Canon gives us 4K at 60 frames for a fourth of the cost. So I wanted to see how the image quality looks and help you decide if this is the right camera for you, specifically for video shooting. Now, first, let's talk about the build quality and design. The camera is super small and lightweight without being too small, still fits nicely in the hand, just a tad smaller than the R5. The button layout is pretty normal for a Canon mirrorless camera, except for this guy right here is usually a wheel that you can turn, and instead it's just an up, down, left, right button, which is fine. I'm just used to the wheel being right there, so it does take a second to get used to. Instead, the aperture wheel is up here, and in the center of this aperture wheel, you have a little joystick that you can use for browsing the menu or changing your autofocus points. The menu system and touchscreen are pretty normal for Canon cameras as well, nothing out of the ordinary. But one change they've made on the R7 from the R5, and something that I hated on the R5, was the process of switching between photo to video mode. It was super inefficient. You'd have to push the mode button, then the info button, then the set button. Three buttons. But with the R7, you just have the on switch that puts you into photo mode, and if you switch it one more time, you're in video mode. Just one step, not three. Good job, Canon. But let's talk about a few of the standout features and specs of the camera, and then I'll show you how it performs in some of the tests. Now, first off, this is a photo first camera, specifically specializing in photographing fast moving subjects like sports and wildlife. But no, I'm not gonna be talking about photo capabilities in this video. You'll have to get that elsewhere. Suffice it to say though, it has some awesome photo features like 15 frames per second shooting, 32 and a half megapixels, in-body image stabilization, and super fast autofocus. So if you're a video shooter that also does photo, Photo, the photo side won't disappoint. It is a very capable hybrid camera. But for video, like I mentioned, the feature I was most excited about was 4K at 60 frames per second. Now keep in mind, this is an APS-C sensor camera, which means it's going to have a crop factor of 1.6. Its bigger brothers, the R6 and R5, are full frame. So that's the biggest difference to be aware of and reason why you'd upgrade to the R6 or R5. But the R6 comes in at $1,000 more expensive. So you're gonna have to ask yourself if that larger sensor size is worth it or not. However, can Canon does have the 0.71 RF to EF adapter that brings the RF's 1.6 crop to a 1.13 crop factor. So it almost gives you a full frame field of view option if you pick up that $600 adapter instead of going up to the R6. But as far as the image quality on the 4K60 on the R7, it looks really good. All the clips at the beginning were shot at 4K at 60 on the Ronin gimbal with a 16 to 35 EF lens on a 0.17X adapter and a polarizer. And personally, I didn't see any difference in quality that would make me think this looks worse than my 1DX Mark II 4K at 60 frames per second footage or my R5, which have been two of my go-to cameras for many years. Keep in mind though that you have IPB and IPB light, no all-eye setting. IPB is just a more compressed file size, which has its pros and cons, the pro being obviously that the file sizes are gonna be much smaller, but the con being that the image is gonna be more compressed and maybe harder to edit. But for those of you who primarily shoot for online delivery on YouTube, social media, whatnot, your images are being compressed way more than IPB compression anyway, so you'll almost never notice a difference between all I or IPB. I personally use compressed formats like IPB all the time as it's plenty high quality enough for any social media content like this YouTube video. And another vital part of my workflow for high quality YouTube videos are my titles and animations, of which you've been enjoying so far in this video. And for those wondering where we got those presets, we used Storyblocks, and they are our sponsor today. Now, personally, when I'm consuming other people's tutorials, good titles and animations make the content much easier to digest and more comprehensive, and they increase the engagement. But a lot of creators don't use them because they can be super time consuming to create from scratch or people just don't know where to get high quality presets that are easy to use and that's why I use Storyblocks. I can easily pick and choose from their complete stock library of over 1 million royalty free assets and it's not just title animations they also have audio tracks, images, after effects, templates, sound effects, they have a lot of assets. With their affordable subscription plan you can download and try any asset you want and with their unlimited all access plan you can quickly try out multiple options and see 
see which video or sound or title best fits your project. So big thanks to Storyblocks for sponsoring this video. We'll put a link to Storyblocks in the description below or just go to storyblocks.com slash Parker. But coming back to the image quality, you'll notice that in the resolution options, you have a 4K fine option as well, which is basically a 7K image over sampled to 4K. So you'll get a little bit more sharp detail. And here's a side by side of 4K versus 4K fine. You see that you get a slightly better image quality with the fine setting. However, when shooting in 4K fine, it limits you to 30 frames per second, no 60 frame per second option here. But if you're going to be shooting in 30 or 24, I do recommend using the fine setting. Also comparing both the normal 4K and 4K fine options against my R5, the sharpness of the image seemed to be about the same to me. So no noticeable difference in 4K quality from the R5. So overall, 4K image quality is really good on the R7, definitely professional level. But this camera can also shoot 120 frames per second, but at 1080p. And here's a look at some of that footage. The 1080p is actually pretty solid. It's not too soft and mushy like some 120 frame per second options I've seen in other cameras. It doesn't, however, allow you to record audio and it's not 4K, which cameras like the R6, R5, C70 will give you 4K at 120, but it does have full autofocus capacity at 120. So not bad for the super slow-mo option here. As for dynamic range, we aren't gonna get scientific, but it's definitely not gonna be on par with my C70 DGO sensor that can shoot up to 16 stops of dynamic range. So so coming from that camera that I use primarily, I can definitely notice a difference. I just don't get the same highlight detail that I'm used to. But compared to other mirrorless cameras in Canon's lineup, I don't think you're going to see a significant difference in performance. All of these hybrid cameras are decent in the dynamic range department, but not great. So this is why I've shifted over to using primarily cinema cameras like the C70 is because of that better dynamic range. But the R7 does have 10-bit color depth and a C-Log3 recording option, which is awesome for being able to match with higher-end Canon cinema cameras. So I'd easily be able to use this as a B camera on a shoot where my C70 is my A camera. So it's crazy to me to see a $1,500 body offering 4K at 60 at 10-bit C-Log3. There's so much data in such a small body in this price point. Another nice feature is there is no 30 minute recording limit. I thought I'd never say it, but they finally did away with it, hallelujah. And I imagine this will be the norm from here on out for most Canon cameras. Good job, Canon. You're starting to figure it out. The question though is how long can it actually record before overheating? This is another reason I shoot mostly on the C70 is because it doesn't overheat like most hybrid cameras. As for the R7, I did a couple indoor tests at normal temperatures and when shooting at normal 4K at 24 mode, it won't ever overheat. And when shooting at 4K at 60, I recorded it for over two hours straight and the overheating symbol did come on screen but never got past halfway on its overheating meter. So personally, I couldn't get it to overheat at 4K 60 maybe if it was sitting in direct sunlight. And then when shooting at 4K fine at 24, same thing, over two hours straight and I couldn't get it to overheat. I even put that one in direct sunlight for a while. So I was actually pleasantly surprised with these overheating results. But that's it for some of the specs. Let's now look at some of the performance categories. First up is autofocus. This is where this guy really shines. It's very reliable in most scenarios. A lot of different autofocus settings to choose from, including person tracking, animal tracking, vehicle tracking, and it does all of those very well. The one autofocus feature I wish it did have that again, I only have on my C70 is face only tracking so that when a subject turns or leaves the frame completely, it doesn't hunt or go to the background. It just waits until the face returns. Other than that, this is one of the most reliable autofocus cameras I've used. As for low light, smaller sensors like an APS-C are typically going to perform slightly worse in low light than larger sensors like an R6. Now, I don't own an R6, so I couldn't directly compare, but from other tests I've seen online, the R6 does do better in low light. And comparing to my R5, it's also going to perform worse. But again, for the budget, it's not too bad. I'd say you have a clean image up to around 3200 ISO. 6400, I think, is where it starts to fall apart. So I'd try and keep it under that for usable footage. As for image stabilization, it does have in-body image stabilization. And when you combine that with lens image stabilization, it can give you some very stable shots when shooting handheld and obviously helps for shooting photography as well. As for battery life, I ran it at 4K at 24 frames per second, continuous recording, and it lasted for two hours and 40 minutes, which I was honestly surprised by. And the last feature worth mentioning is that you can dual record. It appears that Canon is just addressing one complaint after another and seems to have fixed a lot of issues from earlier mirrorless camera releases. But let's talk downsides. 
The biggest downsides to be aware of is the smaller APS-C sensor, which we've talked about. It gives you less depth of field. It does worse in low light. And that's the biggest reason this is $1,000 cheaper than the R6. This may be a deal breaker for you and may be worth going up to the R6 to get that bigger sensor. But besides that, honestly, I don't see a lot of downsides of this camera for the price. And with the accessory of the 0.71X adapter, it pretty much gives you a full frame field of view as well. They've packed it with quite a few features that are typically reserved for higher price products. Products. So I do believe this is now one of the best bang for buck video cameras on the market and something I wish existed when I first started. So who is this camera for? I think this is a big step up from a beginner camera and is a great option for videographers who are on a budget but want loads of features but aren't quite ready to go into that full frame world and price point. So I would call this the perfect second camera upgrading from a beginner camera. Or it's also an awesome B camera to an R5 or R6 or even to the Canon cinema cameras like the C70 as a it can shoot in C-Log3, so you'll be able to match colors pretty well. I also think this makes for a great vlogging camera due to its size and image stabilization and autofocus features. And it's also an awesome camera just for hobbyists or anyone looking to document home videos or whatnot. So there you have my thoughts on the R7. I was pleasantly surprised with its performance. For years now, I've been telling people that Sony was always the better option in this mid-tier price range and that Canon reserved their best features for higher price cameras. But I think the R7 breaks that mold because the equivalent in this price range for Sony is the APS-C A6600 at $1,400, but only shoots 4K at 30 frames and 24 megapixel photos at 11 frames a second and doesn't have a true flip screen, but just this weird flip up screen. So personally, I think Canon just overtook Sony in this price range, and this will now be my new top recommendation at that $1,500 price point. So those are my thoughts. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, if you'd like to learn more about how to shoot and edit videos professionally, make sure to check out our new starter course in the description below. For just $27, you can learn the basics from scratch about camera settings, lighting, audio, editing tips, and we include my favorite LUT that I use to color a lot of the footage throughout this video. But that does it. Don't forget to subscribe for more camera reviews like this. And if you have any further questions, please let me know.